Nigeria, like most other countries in Africa, now has a democratic government, quote and unquote. How can ordinary citizens, I mean, like that, the woman in that market in the sun selling mangoes with a baby strapped on her back, has two other children at home of school age, you know, who are not in, in proper schools or, you know, who are in government schools that are not well run or even completely out of school. Her husband is out there, maybe, you know, working as a gardener somewhere, also, you know, struggling just so that they can make ends meet for their families. How do these people get to now compel our so-called democratically elected gov uh, government to see that this neoliberal um, agenda is not beneficial to us? You know, how can we compel them, you know, to make a shift from this ideology towards one which incorporates more social justice? But the issue, first of all, is that we must interrogate, interrogate the whole idea that indeed there is um, some democracy in Africa. <laughs> uh, that, that we even have a full blown democracy. Because I, I am very convinced that part of the reason why it is very possible for the international financial you know, um, capital and investors to actually hijack you know, our societies is because our governments are not democratic. They, 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 they have elections regularly. And um, the fact that you have periodic elections does not necessarily make you a democracy. Uh, Fayid Sakaraya, the guy that runs GPS, Global uh, Public Sphere, on CNN had actually written an article a long time ago, uh, which was titled Illiberal Democracies. And it says there are uh, democracies or there are societies around the world where you have elections regularly, and yet those same countries, you know, routinely violate the human rights of their citizens. He says those are no democracies. They are pseudo quasi democracies or illiberal democracies. And so for first challenge for Africans is to see that indeed we entrench real democracy in Africa. And it will require, like you said, that we uh, uh, um, um, galvanize the grassroots people to ensure that when elections are coming, they are fully involved in the political process. If I collect money or somebody collects money and then votes for some charlatans, that's no democracy. That's a caricature of democracy. Yes, I, wanted to, I wanted to say that. I really, they are involved in, 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 uh, in elections. Those people at the grassroots level. It's just that they are, uh, they are being used. Um, they are the ones who go and line up on the days of elections in the suns, in the sun. These same grassroots people, but they are the ones who are waylaid by the political parties, giving four thousand naira, five thousand naira, depending on what they are giving, you know, uh, or who end up voting for people because maybe they are from the same village or the the the, the child of some a, a, a poly, um, of a father who used to be a prominent figure. What I'm saying is that they do not link. How do we get them to link? You know, that time she spends in the sun eking um, and er earning that is not enough to sustain her family or ensure her children's um, education. How do we get them to link that to, you know, to them coming out to line up on election day and then using their votes, you know, to get these people to compel them to serve them instead of these global war powers? Because on the long run, it is not in the interest of the neo-colonizers for our governments to, to work well, you know, from what it's looking like, corruption, which is already a problem with us. If corruption, the problem of corruption is solved and we actually have responsible leaders there, they are less likely to keep pursuing this uh, neoliberal agenda. So nobody is going to fight for us. Uh, um, actually, I was going to touch on that issue. Uh, really, to enlighten, and you use the word, they're using these people. 
yeah. you're manipulating them. Now, there's something that happened when this COVID started. People were saying, where are all those politicians who were bringing money during the elections? Because they all seem to simply disappear. Now, the point is that, yes, we need to be able to educate those who are the grassroots to see how their predicament is connected to wrong policies that are imposed on us by, you know, international financial institutions who have their own agenda, mm. which is completely detrimental and different from the agenda of the people who are on ground. They need to know that. And I, the political parties would have done us a lot of, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it now, uh, giving us, they would have done a lot of good if they are on ground to do the education, because they are the ones that actually educate the electorate. But unfortunately, we don't have such political parties in this part of the world. Most of the political parties we have do not have ideologies. They are just concerned about, you know, financial opportunities in government. And because we don't have such parties, political parties couldn't do the job, unless, of course, there's a way we can, um, you know, catalyze a situation where this such a political party or such political parties will emerge. In, in the absence of that, we perhaps will have to fall back on our intellectuals, radical intellectuals, who need to now connect Taiwan Gang. They must become not just intellectual, but also activists who are able to, you know, connect with um, all the town halls. We have town halls, you know, all over the place, which a lot of the times are actually hijacked like and manipulated by the, the powers that be. But the, by politicians, so to be very specific. But the intellectual, radical intellectuals can still do something in trying to ensure that when you have such, such town halls, they infiltrate the place. They are on ground. Of course, I understand that sometimes they actually, this is strictly by invitation, they invite some people. But it, at such points, even if you're not invited, we can actually have a, a set of um, people who have different opinions, who are outside their kind of placards and all that. That happens when you have climate you know, change um, um, dialogues and you see the civil society all over, out, they weren't invited. But their views, one way or the other, percolates into, you know, the floor of the meeting, and it is in a way considered. So uh, I, I, intellectuals have a, a very big role to play in saying that we educate those who are the grassroots to see that their plight is high, heavily connected to policies that are coming from, you know, international financial institutions and from the advanced world. You mentioned CSOs just now, yeah. NGOs, civil society, uh, community-based organizations. But there's also the problem that these organizations are very often funded, you know, by countries, um, the former colonial um, co um, countries. Um, they are funded from abroad, People whose interests do not necessarily coincide with the interest of the grassroots person in the uh, developing uh, world. And he who pays the piper calls the tune. So these NGOs themselves also have a challenge because for them to survive, they just have to play along with the people who fund them, you know. How do they find a balance between their need for finances to finance their projects, you know, and um, these uh, opposing interests of the of the funders? The CSOs are actually treading a very delicate ground uh, uh, in the sense that they need to do that balancing that you have mentioned. I think one way they, they could do this, uh, essentially, is to ensure that uh, they, they, they comply with their funders, but in some way also resist where it is necessary. And they have to do that very incrementally. Any radical departure from the funding body, of course, means that you're going to lose that funding. Uh, but beyond that, it, it also, it also um, you know, I, I think that uh, we, we, we must deal more, the CSOs, uh, in a very... Because this is, this is more, more like a war and you have to devise a strategy. The, the CSO may have to look for means of influencing the government on the ground 
in such a way that it's not as uh, overt as what their fund has to see. It's crucial to be able to do that. And um, beyond that, I think they also have partners overseas who actually um, have similar you know, positions with them in terms of saying that we have more, more justice, more equality across the world. They can also connect with these um, counterparts overseas to share ideas, experience, and perhaps even get funding. So, so, so basically, uh, the point is these civil society organizations have to do what they have to do at the local level in terms of reaching out to the government in a very covert manner. And of course, at the, on, on, on the other hand, ensuring that they connect with the counterpart of the disease. But where they get funding from you know, conservative government, I think they should play, uh, play, play in a very subtle manner. Sub two in the sense that <laughs> you might not be seen to be, because some of this funding we're talking about, sometimes it's directly allocated to poverty alleviation projects. When that is, why not get that funding and use it? But, on the, but we must, they must always ensure, we must always ensure, uh, with those, uh, we always ensure that we do not just allow the government to uh, run policies that are counter um, social justice and that uh, will negatively affect poor for um, vulnerable individuals. Now, let's look at the current uh, pandemic <clears throat> that's going on in relation to, to Africa. Trump calls COVID-19 the Chinese virus. The Chinese say that the uh, Americans brought it to Wuhan when they came for the military games in uh, October 2019. And then there has been... Um, some confirmed reports of Chinese blaming Africans for spreading the virus and using it as an excuse to, to discriminate against Africans in their country. Do any of these allegations have any credence? It's, it has no credence. It has no basis. Because the truth of the matter is that international travel is what is responsible for the spread of this uh, COVID-19 and I made it so fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, the age, one of the things that defines the globalizing world is the advancement in transportation and information technology. And mm -hmm. transportation technology has made it easy for us to travel around the world faster than ever before. And that explains why it is that COVID-19 was able to spread across the nation very fast. I think it's a lame argument to say that it's um, some black people because different types of people, black, white, yellow, whatever you call them, are traveling around the world. So in the second position that globalization is responsible for the spread of uh, COVID-19, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's clearly valid. And um, the empirical ep evidence around us to show that that's the case. I mean, that's how it spread around the world is through international travel. I remember all the cases at the initial the, the, that took place in Nigeria where people who traveled abroad who came back. So it is international travel. It has nothing to do with blacks. It has everything to do with uh, different people traveling around the world. Well, there are speculations that the world economic order might change as a result of this COVID-19. Um, how might the world economic order change and how might it affect Africa? I... I we, we, we could speculate, but I'm very, very skeptical that we might have any fundamental change take place, you know, uh, after the pandemic. Because what I've seen in, during the pandemic is ultra-nationalism. We are nations are simply, you know, focusing on their immediate problem and forgetting about their neighbors and even their regions. And so I, I don't see th that that will change as soon as the pandemic is over. Of course, one thing that happens uh, about nations and um, internationalism, global cooperation, it, 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 it fluctuates from time to time. At some point, nations will say, okay, let us go. And what is actually happening? Even before now, it's, it's interesting. Uh, with the rise of Trump, the rise of ultranationalist parties in Europe, we've seen a situation where countries are recoiling back into themselves and um, becoming more interested in the general welfare of, of the globe. And so... I don't think that will, the pandemic will change that. But look at the competition over vaccines. There is a very you know, steep competition. Everyone is trying to outdo the other, say, okay, if I can produce vaccine first, that means I make plenty of money. And so it, it's clear to me that the competition will still be there. 
It's clear to me that um, global cooperation will only happen when perhaps that is in the interest of everybody. Now, of course, I, I, I also want to think that um, the spot, so to speak, between China and the USA will go a long way to determine the direction of the global economy. But I tell you, there is so much trade going on between those countries. I think I had somewhere online that's about $5 trillion $5 trade taking place. So I don't even see any too long a conflict between these two countries. After some time, because of the common interest they have in the common trade and in their investments, they will eventually make up. Uh, and then, of course, the global economy runs the way we run. So I don't see any fundamental change taking place. That, that's uh, my position on this matter. Thank you once again. Thank you so much.